The 6 o'clock news starts right now. As the number of people infected with the coronavirus continues to grow, health experts across the country reminding everyone the risk to the public remains low. This is California, declares a state of emergency after six new cases and its first death confirmed, bringing the national death toll to 11, the majority of which are in Washington state. There are now more than 110 cases across the country. Meanwhile, a San Antonio couple says keeping a positive attitude got them through weeks of quarantine after being on that Diamond Princess cruise ship where some passengers contracted the coronavirus. After being held on the ship two weeks after they were supposed to disembark, they spent weeks at Lackland under federal quarantine. Yesterday, they returned home to piles of mail and an overgrown lawn, but instead of complaining, today they laughed with our Devin Clark about their experience. It was more like an adventure than it was a, a ordeal. Don and Natty were excited about taking a cruise throughout Asia from Japan. The retired couple boarded the Diamond Princess cruise ship back on January 20th. They laughed, danced, and ate. They expected to disembark on February 4th. The captain increased the, the ship speed and got us back in on the third so we knew something was happening. They learned that a fellow passenger who felt sick and got off the ship in Hong Kong tested positive for COVID-19. They also learned they'd have to be quarantined on the ship. When we went inside our stateroom, wow, somebody put our suitcase back. <laughs> Something is happening that is not good. A friend they made on the ship from Australia tested positive. Don and Natty never did, but they kept positive attitudes, even having a modest Valentine's Day celebration. They also got encouragement from outsiders. Then we had one guy come by in his boat dressed like Spider-Man or something. On February 17th, they finally got off the ship and immediately on a plane to Lackland Air Force Base. Once again, quarantined for weeks. They kept high spirits until they learned their quarantine might have to be extended. That was a point of total frustration and low spirits. But after assessing public risk, a federal judge ruled that they could leave. One of the first things they did after getting home yesterday. We get to vote. <laughs> we even, yes, we were so concerned that we would not be able to have the opportunity to vote. <laughs> And the Princess Cruise Line not only refunded the couple for their entire trip, but they also gave them a credit towards another trip, which they plan to use in a few months when they take a 56-day cruise. Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. And KSAT, along with our community partners, teaming up with the San Antonio Food Bank for a coronavirus preparedness and prevention campaign. The goal here is to collect enough food and supplies to put together 300,000 coronavirus preparedness kits. Those kits will go to low income families and seniors in the event that there is an outbreak. Some of the most needed items are non perishable foods, diapers and pet food. The kits will also include hand sanitizer and disinfectant, and you can help by dropping off donations at the food bank off of Highway 151. For more information, visit KSAT.com slash KSAT community. The charges are serious, and the jury seems to be aware of that. They've been deliberating since just before noon, trying to decide whether Rosalinda Olalde is guilty of intoxication manslaughter in a crash that killed a driver and critically injured his passengers. Paul Venema in court as her attorney and prosecutors review the evidence for the jury. This crash killed 22-year-old Mario Velasquez Plow and seriously hurt four passengers in his car. Driving drunk and speeding, 22-year-old Rosalinda Olalde caused the crash. That's what prosecutors told the jury during her trial on intoxication manslaughter and intoxication assault charges. What is the evidence that suggests this beyond a reasonable doubt? While acknowledging that his client had been drinking, Duarte questioned the prosecution's experts that said her blood alcohol level was 0.18. And though another expert said she was going 80 miles an hour when she crashed broadside into the victim's car, he argued that Velasquez's plow caused the crash. He said he failed to stop before driving onto the Loop 1604 access road. If he stayed behind the line, the collision would not have happened. Prosecutors were quick to challenge that argument. Their argument, there's only one person responsible for the crash, and it wasn't the victim. 
They say Olalde caused the crash when, driving drunk, she veered from the access road, hitting the victim's car as it crossed the sidewalk while trying to enter the access road. She was alone on that road, on that access road. She was speeding and nothing else caused her to get on that sidewalk but her loss of control. She said the evidence was clear and supported a guilty verdict. Paul Venom, a case at 12 News. You know the situation is a standoff with an armed man who set fire to a car and a house. But digging deeper showed us it's really a mental health story with a tragic ending. David Claiborne died inside his home February 18th after he set it on fire. Our Courtney Friedman spoke to his sister, distraught but determined to set the record straight that sadly this was her brother's fault and no one else's. It's an exclusive story you'll find only on KSAT. 28-year-old David Claiborne grew up in this home, and on February 18th, he died there. A string of events led to this. SWAT team surrounding the burning house, Claiborne armed inside. The first fire Claiborne set was to his neighbor's car. We just spoke to that neighbor, and he showed us this gas can. It's still pretty full, actually. He said Claiborne brought it over, and it helped him start this fire. He's always had issues, but two months ago he started hearing voices. Claiborne's sister, Marie Winchie, says her brother's mental illness was intensified by the meth he began using about six months ago. He believed that Sam across the street was holding uh, his baby mama and baby hostage in there. He could, like, in his mind, he could see the baby being held up in there, and that's why he targeted Sam's house. Off camera, Sam told us Claiborne hurled this dresser through his front window, set his car on fire, and ran back into the house when police showed up. His parents were still inside. My mom told me that he had grabbed a gun, and that's my dad called me soon afterwards. And that's when he kind of panned his video phone around, and I saw my brother going up the stairs with the gun. And that's when I was like, no, you need to get out of the house. Police say Claiborne got on the roof with the gun before eventually throwing a Molotov cocktail into the home, setting it on fire. The medical examiner said he died from smoke inhalation. With shaking hands, when she sets blame in the toughest of places. It was mental health. It was my brother thought something was happening that wasn't happening. Though heart-wrenching, she says the truth is necessary. I don't want this to ever happen to somebody else. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. That sister says she's still grappling with some questions for police. She says her parents are deaf, and during that six-hour standoff, police were asked to send interpreters, but no one ever showed up. SAPD told us their protocol says if the police matter is serious and the individual cannot be escorted to the nearest deaf link location, the officer shall request a qualified interpreter. The department told us they're looking into why an interpreter did not make that scene. When she, the sister, also said Sam called police four, called police four times that morning. She said officers showed up the first three times but never came after the fourth call made right before Sam's car was set on fire. We asked police about this. They told us they're still looking into it. Other top stories we are following today. Police shot and killed a man who lived in her house. Through pain and trauma, she admits the shooting was justified. This woman did not want to be identified, but told KSAT that her mom's boyfriend, Richard Rodriguez, had lived with them for about a year. She calls him a good person who was kind to her daughters, but said he was in a strange state early Saturday morning when he came home yelling and damaging things in the house. She said he grabbed a gun and began waving it at her and her daughters. Then police showed up. Do you feel like police did the right thing? Yes, they did. Was he pointing the gun at them? Yes. He pointed it at them and they told him four times. They did tell him, like, put it down and he refused to. And they shot at him. My daughters were inside the house and I just pushed, like, my daughters out. She and her mother both say Rodriguez was never abusive and this was out of character. They say after the shooting, detectives told them Rodriguez was likely on methamphetamines. The police tell us it was an argument over laundry that led a man to being slashed by a machete late last night. Officers called to a home in the 150 block of Ashland about 1130 after receiving reports of a cutting. They said the two roommates involved had been arguing over one of the men leaving their clothes in the washing machine too long. That then led to one hitting the other with a broomstick, which later escalated to involve that machete wielded by 55 year old Paul Butler. From the front door, I mean, to the bathroom, down the hallway, the kitchen was completely full of blood. 
The 58 year old victim slashed several times before being taken to the hospital with what police say were life threatening wounds. Police say Butler fled the scene. He hasn't been found yet. Time saver traffic right now. This is Highway 90 at 36th Street. It is an accident in the westbound lanes of Highway 90 that you see there off to the side. Looks like a tow truck has just arrived on the scene. Hopefully that means it's clearing. And voila, it just did. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> Look outside with live cam, 62 degrees out there. What a beautiful day this turned out to be after that rain, Adam. It did, and we even had a few sun showers this afternoon, which left in its wake some rainbows across South Texas, and I have a great video or photo from one of our viewers to share with you in a moment. But I do want to talk about what's really cranking up out there, and that's the wind. Here are the latest wind gusts across Bear County. At the airport in San Antonio, 33 at Southside, Stinson gusting up to 30 miles per hour. So we're going to notice the wind the rest of this evening and through the night. Temperature wise, near average for this time of year. 62 now, 53 at 10 p.m. And by tomorrow morning, we'll be in the mid to upper 40s. We'll talk about our next chance of rain coming right up. Thank you, Adam. It was a historic night in Bear County politics. More than a quarter million people voted in the primary. But as Dylan Collier explains, the big turnout last night and during early voting led to problems at election headquarters. Tuesday brought with it the usual jubilation of election night victories for some candidates, albeit much later than Bear County residents are used to seeing. Election Administrator Jackie Callanan this morning said issues arose the moment they tried to post early results. Callanan then said the system run by ES&S crashed three times, making for a very long night and early morning. It crashed. And then we said, okay, let's start over. Even with vendor support available on site, results were not made public until well after midnight. County Clerk Lucy Adame Clark, vice chair of the five person county election commission, told us on the phone today she was disappointed by what took place, but wants to wait until she gets the full story before deciding what possible changes to make. Last night broke the Bear County record for the total number of people to vote in a primary, raising questions about whether the software, as it's currently configured, can handle a possible surge of voters come November. I would like to say yes, but I think that's one question that I, I can't answer. Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Still to come at 6, the death toll rises in Tennessee after tornadoes devastate parts of Nashville and surrounding areas. And plus, the number of deaths related to vaping also going up across the country. That story after the break. He was, he was goofy and he, he always put a smile on everyone's face. He was a father of two, just 23 years old, getting ready to marry the love of his life. Tonight on the Night Beat, his fiance talks about the loss as police search for who killed Shaheen El Khalili. The number of reported vaping deaths in the United States has now risen to 59. The youngest person, now a 15 year old boy from Dallas. Meanwhile, more than 2,600 people have been hospitalized with serious or critical lung injuries caused by vaping. Most of those emergency room visits spiked in September, but Ursula Perry shows us those close to the crisis say this danger is far from over. It wasn't the white smoke or the fruity smell that tipped off Michael Doherty to his son's vape use. The device itself fell out of his son's pocket onto the floor. My initial reaction was anger. You know, you know, how could you do this? Michael says Jimmy vowed to quit, but on September 9th, one week after his 20th birthday, Jimmy's health spiraled downward. After three days of vomiting and a high fever, Michael rushed him to the emergency room. And they show us the CT scan of his lungs, and you can see the damage from top to bottom throughout. Jimmy's systems were failing. As painful as it was to watch, Michael snapped photos. He's in this medically induced coma on a ventilator and sedated. He's not going to remember it. And he needs to see 
that image. Sometimes the lungs fail completely and you need to use a uh, mechanical ventilation or use an ET tube um, to help support them on a breathing machine. For some, ECMO has been a last resort. It's a life support machine that pumps the patient's blood into an artificial lung, sending oxygenated blood back to the body. After several weeks in the hospital, Jimmy's lungs started to improve. Now he's working part time and regaining his strength. Michael, meantime, is sharing the family story to warn others about the dangers. Yes, it can happen to you. Michael says that his son bought his vaping products at an established store, assuming that would make them safe. The CDC right now does not know which items are causing these problems, but they do say that some marijuana products appear to be the cause. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. All right, what a beautiful Wednesday this oh, was. Yeah. Cooler, crisper. It's nice. Yeah, we had the storms move through a thin line early this morning. Yeah. Affected the morning commute some. And then we had a few little quick sun showers on the back side of this system this afternoon, which is kind of fun to see. I like that. Uh, partially because it's perfect rainbow making weather. And that's what we got this afternoon and evening in some parts of South Texas. So let's start with a great shot here from our KSAC Connect app. This is up in the Bernie area and a beautiful double rainbow. You know, technically every rainbow is a double rainbow. You just can't always see this secondary rainbow. Sometimes it's a little too faint, but here, oh, you can see it nicely. Not to the point where you can see the reverse order of the colors, because that's what happens in the secondary, but anyway, good shot there. Fun to see. So we had some decent rainfall overnight and early into the morning hours. As for the aquifer, there's no change registered yet at the J17 well, but we did get some decent rainfall across the recharge or contributing zone and just a little bit uh, right here recharge and more so in the contributing zone. I think the aquifer may boost a little bit as we go into tomorrow, but this is, isn't a huge rain event, not a big drought denter either. 70 degrees are high today after a low of 63, about a half an inch in the rain gauge at the airport, so a decent accumulation there. 62 right now with a dew point of 50, so the dew point's down right now. That northwesterly wind, I talked about the wind gusts earlier. Yeah, there it is, 23 miles per hour. That's the steady northwest wind. It has definitely cranked it up a notch, and you're going to notice that breeze all night tonight. It'll taper off tomorrow morning. Let's talk temperatures. All right, New Braunfels 65, Port SA at 70, Bandera 56, Divine 67 along with Pleasanton. You see a big range of temperatures, especially as you go farther south. Catula 75, nearly 80 in Laredo and Corpus Christi. Meanwhile, lower 50s in parts of the hill country. Temperatures are completely sunshine dependent this afternoon, and because the clouds really held tight, stuck around through the hill country, they were consequ consequently cooler in the 50s, meanwhile pushing 80 south of town. Now let's fast forward through time into early tomorrow morning. Most of us, I think, in the mid 40s to start the day tomorrow at 7 a.m. 47 San Antonio, a little bit cooler in the hill country, and closer to 50 south of town. Then we get into tomorrow afternoon, comfortable. Another beautiful day. We're talking sunshine and lower 70s and get ready for a stretch of very pleasant and comfortable days. Look at this high temperature forecast, low 70s to uh, near 70 as we go through the weekend and then we even warm up a little bit next week. The wind, you're noticing it out there. Here are the latest gusts. Hondo 33 miles per hour, San Antonio International as well. Pleasant and gusting to 24. Here's our wind gust forecast. It's staying up there through tonight and then it the wind will start to taper off and diminish by sunrise tomorrow morning. So the wind's not going to be a factor throughout your Thursday, even though you'll notice it tonight. Don't worry about it for tomorrow. There's a look at some of those little sun showers that moved through. We had a few showers and then sunshine basically bookending them that pushed through on the back end of, edge of the system as it gave us our last hurrah still giving some good rainfall to our friends to the north, especially along I-20 and into the Dallas Fort Worth area. This upper disturbance is pushing eastward. We're getting on the back side of it and as we do so, we're looking at a sunny dry stretch of days here ahead of us. So tomorrow we'll start at 47 bright sunshine all day, making it to 72 for the high temperature and a north wind at only 5 to 15 miles per hour. Then we go through the end of the week and into the weekend. No big changes near average 40s in the mornings, afternoons, low 70s, slight chance of rain by Monday of next week. I wish we had a better shot, but right now we're looking at maybe 20% chance. That's it. Not a bad stretch of days though. 
Oh, sunny and comfortable, pleasant. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. All right, I know he's filled in when Pop got ejected from games. This is the first game he's coached from beginning to end, though, right? Yes, Tim Duncan, the first one, and former Spur, Richard Jefferson, a.k.a. RJ, downplaying Tim Duncan as a head coach, but I got to believe it's all in good fun. Plus, Fredericksburg, the girls' basketball team, going to state, coming up. Coach Brookshire is here. They are very successful, and Coach Grona has done such a good job with our program and getting us here from um, where where they started off with those trophies. And so we're hoping to gain another one. Fredericksburg girls basketball team wants to keep adding to their trophy case after qualifying for this year's state tournament in big board sports. Coach Pop took last night off for personal reasons and handed over the head coaching reins to Tim Duncan. With the big fundamental leading the way in Charlotte, the Spurs fell behind by 17 points in the first quarter, but then rallied to win 104-103. During postgame, Tim praised the rest of the coaching staff. Truth be told, I, I wasn't in the big boy chair. We've got uh, uh, Becky and Will and, and Mitch. Uh, Mitch prepped the game for us. Uh, uh, Becky and, and Will were making all the calls, and I was the only one just standing there uh, screaming at people, uh, uh, nonsensical stuff. Uh, so uh, we did it uh, coach by committee. Farmer Spur Richard Jefferson has San Antonio fans all fired up. Here's what he said about Tim this morning on ESPN's Get Up. Tim Duncan has been given credit for so many things that he hadn't done. Even tonight, this is his first win. He didn't do anything. This was Will. This was Becky Hammond. He said he just stood up and was running his mouth, and good things happened. So I am saying, so mad. So saying, I am so, so I know we're going five to from Allie, but wait. We're saying he <laughs> is the best power forward to ever play the game. You're saying that he's been giving this he's kind of He's been carried by Pop. Tony, Manu, Bruce Bowen, and now here, he gets his first coaching win. He did nothing. Ah, uh, he's joking. Still, RJ isn't making any friends here in town. The Spurs will play at the Nets Friday night at 630. For the first time in over two decades, the Fredericksburg girls basketball team is heading to the state tournament. The Batlin Billies defeated Salado in the regional final on Saturday, 52-40, and now they have a chance to make even more history. Andrew Seeley has more. And that's it, folks. Billies in the final four state tournament. The seeds of Fredericksburg's breakthrough moment were planted in the trophy case just a few feet away from the entrance to their gym, a plaque honoring the last team that advanced to state in 1995. Ever since middle school, we've, we've been coming to varsity games and peeking our heads, touching the glass, you know, and looking through. We've always, like, looked in the trophy case and be like, hey, like, we want to be one of those teams, you know, and finally, like, the dream is coming true and we're being able to go and kind of make our mark. And being that we've hit third round, second round, fourth round the past few years, like we're finally getting past that time and it's like all of our hard work is paying off. The reason why this year's team broke through is pretty simple. Everybody's motivated. Everybody comes to practice each day um, ready to work. It's not one of us. It's not two of us. It's not a star player. It's everyone. Everybody wants to get better at their role. Fredericksburg will have their work cut out for them in the state semis against five-time defending state champion Argyle, but they know exactly what they need on game day. Have confidence and make, making sure that everything that we do is shirt up, um, secure. They know what we're doing, that there's no question about what we do as a program. Calm, cool, collected, and confident, and that's what you have to remember whether you're playing your first game of district or if you're playing in the Alamo Dome for state tournament. The Battle Billies will take on Argyle in the Class 4A state semifinals. That's currently scheduled for a 3 p.m. tip-off on Friday afternoon at the Alamo Dome. From Fredericksburg, Andrew Seeley, KSAT 12 Sports. Thank you, Andrew, and good luck to the Batman Billy. Such a great story. You know, do you think their fan group is called the Billy Club? The Billy Club? <laughs> maybe. We'll have to ask. Yeah. Maybe ask them right can, now. You can use it, Fredericksburg. <laughs> you can use it. Thanks, Larry. <laughs> Still to come, a closer look at the nationwide results from Super Tuesday and how they're impacting the race for the White House. And the Supreme Court hearing arguments in a case which could actually eliminate the protections of Roe v. Wade. And out of some late breaking news, police say a woman in her 60s has died in a car crash on West Avenue. This is near Nassau and Edgebrook. 
We're told she was pulling out of an apartment complex toward I-10 when another vehicle driven erratically by an 83 year old man crashed into her vehicle and flipped over. The hit caused the woman to lose control, then slam into a telephone pole. The man and a passenger in the vehicle which caused the wreck were taken to the hospital. Their conditions unknown at this time. I don't know if you can make out the vehicle that's in the telephone, actually hit the telephone pole. It's a little farther down from this vehicle that you see closest to us. We're going to update you with more information on this crash as it becomes available. Now to the latest in the race for the White House. Another candidate today dropping out. Former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg suspending his campaign and saying he supports Joe Biden, who had a big win last night sweeping the South, including right here in Texas. But the race is far from over. Biden running neck and neck with Senator Bernie Sanders and the delegate count setting up what appears to be a full on two man race. ABC's Serena Marshall reports from Washington. Another candidate out of the presidential race and putting their weight behind former Vice President Joe Biden. I've always believed that defeating Donald Trump starts with uniting behind the candidate with the best shot to do it. And after yesterday's vote, it is clear that candidate is my friend and a great American, Joe Biden. Former New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg had poured more than $230 million into Super Tuesday alone and didn't win a single state. Biden, however... They don't call Super Tuesday for nothing. Capturing 10 of the 15 contests and gaining at least 250 delegates, thanks to surprise wins in Massachusetts, Minnesota, and Texas, where a strong support from black voters helped him edge out Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. Look, Look, uh, we're going to bring together uh, all Americans, and we did that. We showed that last night. Biden now in a two-man race with Sanders, who holds a commanding lead in delegate-rich California, which is still yet to be called, propelled by large margins of the Hispanic vote. He also took victories in Utah, Colorado, and his home state, Vermont. Which side are you on? Uh, Joe and I have a very different vision for the future of this country. And Joe and I are running very different campaigns. The magic number to victory, 1,991 delegates. And the race could play out until the final primary in June and the convention in July. Senator Elizabeth Warren's also still in this race, but after coming in third in her home state of Massachusetts this morning, the senator's staff says she was talking to them about the path forward. Serena Marshall, ABC News, Washington. It is now full steam ahead to the general election in November, but first we've got some runoff races that will play out here in Bear County. And to keep you on top of all of it, we send out our Vote 2020 newsletter every Tuesday. That's where we give you the latest on all the big local, state, and national races and issues. You can sign up for that at ksat.com slash newsletters. Yeah, the Supreme Court heard arguments today in a case which could ultimately change abortion access in America for years to come. It is the first abortion related case to go before Justices Brett Kavanaugh and Neil Gorsuch since the conservatives joined the high court. June Medical Services versus Russo focuses on a 2014 Louisiana state law requiring doctors who perform abortions to have admitting privileges with a hospital within 30 miles of a clinic. Opponents say most doctors in abortion clinics do not have that access. The case, if upheld, would eliminate some of the protections of Roe v. Wade. Their entire goal is to intimidate and close clinics down. These are clinic shutdown laws, essentially. And more importantly, the impact to patients is, is grave. Supporters of the law say it's designed to improve patient safety, making sure they have access to hospital care if they need urgent care. A decision from the court isn't expected until the end of June. Officials in Tennessee say at least 24 people are dead and 22 still missing after devastating tornadoes ripped through Nashville and other parts of that state. Authorities say five children under the age of 13 are among those who died. At least another 88 people are injured. Entire homes, buildings, and even an airport have been demolished. The governor of Tennessee has declared a state of emergency. The area is still very devastated. It's going to take days and possibly weeks to get that area uh, to where it's going to be uh, travelable. Search and rescue crews spent the last 24 hours going through rubble and debris, searching for any more victims. They still have more to go, though. The National Guard has been deployed to help. 
and so are hundreds of volunteers. Coming up in the buzz, where you can watch Daredevil Nick Walenda walk over an active volcano tonight. Plus, why you're going to have to wait a bit longer to see James Bond back on the big screen. Monday through Friday, we bring you the KSAT News at 9. It streams online at KSAT.com and, of course, through the KSAT TV app. And this is the part of the show where we talk about what's coming up tonight. Of course, coronavirus seems to be affecting every aspect of people's lives. Schools have been t talking about the precautions they are taking. Tonight, we're focused on East Central ISD. They have contracted a company out of Lubbock to do some deep cleaning to try to prevent any spread of any illness within their schools. We're going to talk to them about what steps they're taking to try to be proactive here. Yeah, and if yesterday was Super Tuesday, this is what? Okay, Wednesday. <laughs> Let's get some sleep Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, we're going to dissect Super Tuesday, what we saw last night and how this will all play out. I got the chance to talk to Dr. David Crockett from Trinity University's political science department. He's the chair of that department. He had some interesting things to say about the state of the race right now and the surprises from last night, including Michael Bloomberg deciding he'd had enough and getting out today. And we have so many breakdowns on our website right now about the local races, those headed to a yep. runoff, lots to check out at KSAT.com. Speaking of which, we do a segment every night here at 9 called Trending, where we take a look at the stories that are trending on our website. Often they're quirky, out there, a little bit weird, a little bit different, but they're things people are clicking on. So we are bringing that to you tonight at 9. All things trending. Now let's go to the Weather Center and check in with Adam Kasky on all things what? Weather? <laughs> I was going to see where you can go with that. <laughs> I think we got him there, folks. All right, 70 degrees. That was our high temperature today. Look at this, though. We had about a half an inch of rain earlier today from the system that moved through wide ranging temperatures across the state. Look at that 83 in Laredo for the high, but 50s as head into North Texas. Big change across the area. We're going to talk about how our weather pattern is shifting and what that means for the days ahead coming up. Nick Walenda, the man for known walking across scary things, will attempt to complete his longest and highest wire walk yet. Tonight, he'll find himself over an active volcano at the Masaya Volcano National Park in Nicaragua. He'll walk the length of six football fields on a one inch wide steel cable. Yeah, Walenda will have to wear an oxygen mask and compressed air to combat the plumes of toxic gas. That could add up to 13 pounds to his back. The walk itself expected to take about 30 to 35 minutes. The stunt will air live right here on KSAT 12 tonight at 7 o'clock, just a few minutes away, actually. Mm -hmm. Hasbro is bracing for the impact of the coronavirus on the upcoming release of its Star Wars Baby Yoda toys. The company confirmed last week its supply chain is being disrupted by the outbreak. The disruptions haven't derailed production of the toys, but the CEO of the industry review website Toys, Tots, Pets and More said he thinks Baby Yoda toy production will drop by 5 to 10 percent. However, Silver said Hasbro is close to being able to ship what they originally projected. Hasbro says it's working to mitigate the manufacturing impact of the coronavirus. Baby Yoda toys from Hasbro, Funko, Mattel, and Build-A-Bear scheduled to be on store shelves this month. That's a lot of Baby Yoda stuff. The far reaching effects of <laughs> coronavirus. James Bond has faced many supervillains over the past few decades, but he's apparently not eager to face the coronavirus. The latest Bond picture, No Time to Die, has been pushed back to November. It was originally scheduled to be released in April. Yeah, producers won't actually say the coronavirus is specifically to blame. They say the decision came after a thorough evaluation of the global theatrical marketplace. No Time to Die will be released in the United States the day before Thanksgiving, November 25th. I like that, an evaluation of the global theatrical, theatrical market. marketplace. Yes. In other words, <laughs> It's the coronavirus. It's the coronavirus. <laughs> People are going to the movies. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing, the, the, whatever it is, theatrical yeah. marketplace. Market, yes. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. 
All right, so we had some good rain this morning mm -hmm. in parts of South Texas. Not yeah. everybody got in on it. It did, did disrupt the morning commute a little bit, but hey, at least we got some showers out of this deal. So let's start with a look at how much rain fell across our area, and you can see the haves in the hill country, the have nots far south of San Antonio, especially south of Highway 90. So here's a closer look to bear a look in and around Bear County and surrounding communities. Bulverde about half an inch, Alamo Ranch about a third of an inch, downtown about a third of an inch at the airport in San Antonio, uh, almost half an inch. I'd say on average across Bear County and most of San Antonio, about a third of an inch, give or take. Pipe Creek actually uh, measured almost an inch of rain. In some parts of the hill country, we had more than an inch. So it was some good rainfall for some folks earlier today. That line really thinned out this morning as it moved eastward and really dissipated as well. And then we got one little last hurrah of rain moving through Gillespie and Kerr counties this afternoon. And even a few little showers mixed with sunshine in parts of San Antonio, especially the north side of town and earlier this afternoon. So here's a wider view of what happened here over the, just the past 12 hours. This good soaking rainfall for a good chunk of Texas, especially North Texas and parts of West Texas. That's actually where we don't need the rain. You look at the latest drought monitor and we're completely drought free. Basically the northern half of Texas or the northern two thirds, you could argue. I mean, only 20% of the state is considered in drought. And then this yellow area considered abnormally dry. And as our luck would be here, yeah, the drought is confined to South Texas, our area, and even some areas of what's considered extreme drought here. As you get west and south of San Antonio, even pockets of Gonzales County and uh, Wilson and Carnes County is considered in that extreme drought. So we need the rain more than anybody, but it was falling over our friends up to the north. Temperature wise today, look at the difference. We had some 60s in the hill country briefly, but 80 degrees south of town, even 84 Beeville, 80 the high in Catula. It was all the difference of clouds to the north, sunshine to the south. And right now we're in the lower 50s in the hill country. Fredericksburg 51, 52 in Rock Springs and Kerrville. Meanwhile, 61 here in San Antonio, but we're still in the 70s, much warmer south of town. So big temperature difference out there today, all because of the folks that had the clouds to the north and the sunshine to the south. Now, early tomorrow morning, temperatures will even out quite a bit more. I think we'll be about 44 in Kerrville, 48 in Uvalde, 48 Catula, 51 in Pleasanton, 47 here in San Antonio. For the most part, you know, on the north side of Bear County, even into Timberwood Park, Leon Springs, Bernie, you're looking at 46 degrees in the morning. South side of town, near 50, about 51 in Elmendorf, 50 in Lavernia. Then by the afternoon, with a lot of sunshine, Low 70s and beautiful. What we have to contend with the rest of this evening and tonight is the wind. It's gusting around 30 to 35 miles per hour in spots, and that's going to be the case through tonight. You'll notice the gusty wind all night tonight, and then it's going to taper off by sunrise tomorrow. So don't worry about the wind being a factor in your day tomorrow. It's not going to be all that noticeable by then. Clearing this evening, temps falling into the 50s pretty quickly by 10 p.m. 53. Midnight 51 at sunrise 47. So a hint of a chill in the air tomorrow morning, but bright sunshine will warm us to 72 into the afternoon with the north wind at 5 to 15. And then it's just more of the same Friday, Saturday, and pretty much even into Sunday. Just Sunday, some extra clouds. But overall, near average for this time of year and no good chance of rain anytime soon, unfortunately. But temperatures will be up and no strong cold fronts. All right. Thanks, Adam. Mm -hmm. Settling into another pattern. It looks like it, doesn't yeah. it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. In case you missed it, up next. It is Wednesday. It is March 4th. The search for a San Antonio murder suspect is now over. San Antonio police confirming today a body discovered last night on the city's south side is 42 year old Andrew Munoz. He'd been on the run since Friday after police say he kidnapped his ex girlfriend, 43 year old Maricela Cadena, last week. Two days later, he shot and killed her inside a Subway restaurant. According to the medical examiner, Munoz died of a gunshot wound to the head. It is unclear at this time whether it was self-inflicted.
A fight between two people leads to one of them being cut by a machete. This happened around 1120 last night in the 100 block of Ashland Drive, which is on the northeast side. San Antonio police say two men were roommates. They're in their 50s. They had an argument that led to one of them slashing the other across the hand. The victim was taken to the hospital with possible life-threatening injuries. The suspect got away in a vehicle. At last check, police were still looking for him. The Super Tuesday surprises continue. Joe Biden receiving overwhelming support in the South, while Bernie Sanders currently leads in California. But did Super Tuesday answer this? Do we know who the Democratic nominee will be? We have come a long, long way. Not yet, not by a mile. President Donald Trump is donating his quarterly salary to efforts to stop the growing coronavirus outbreak. The White House press secretary tweeted a picture of his check along with the announcement. The president is giving the $100,000 to, quote, support the efforts being undertaken to confront, contain, and combat hashtag coronavirus. The money will go to the Department of Health and Human Services. Six people have died from the virus in the United States, and there are at least 60 known cases nationwide. We're looking at a sunny, pleasant stretch of days here. 47 tomorrow morning, so be long sleeves in the morning, but by the afternoon, low 70s. And that's going to be the trend here through Friday, even on into Saturday. By Sunday, feeling similar, just a little extra clouds in the sky, maybe a few sprinkles by Monday. Good thermometer making weather. That's <laughs> what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. I know you were. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Thanks for watching the News at 6. See you on the night beat at 10 and, of course, online at 9.